Welcome to Real Life. Hi, I'm Jim Miller, and you're listening to the Real Life LA podcast, coming to you from multiple locations in the San Gabriel Valley of sunny Southern California. We're a church for everyone, and we exist to lead people to Jesus, a community of grace with a God-sized vision that reaches from generation to generation. As you hear today's message, we pray that God speaks specifically to you and opens your heart and inspires you to live each day with more joy, beauty, and wonder. Hey, Real Life Church, God bless you. It's Pastor Jim. Uh, It's good to be with you again. Um, It's been a a heavy week as we process the the tragedy uh, that just happened in Texas, right on the heels of other tragedies that happened at a church in California and up at a a shopping center in New York. Uh, And it's just a, a constant reminder that our world is broken. And rather than rushing to anger and rushing to blame or rushing to fix it, uh, we might want to pause a moment and, and dwell in our grief. And I know that's not a comfortable place to be, but, but grief is a healthy response to a broken world. And the world is broken. The world is tragically broken. Uh, and we maintain some social norms that keep the fabric of society together. But behind that is a, a deep brokenness that is at a spiritual level. And we may, we may not want to rush past the grief because the grief is, is a way to confront reality, to, to look into the brokenness of the world and say, it's not supposed to be this way. The world shouldn't be like this. There's something, there's something at a profound level, at, the, at the, the foundational level of the universe that isn't right. And that, that's the biblical story, that God created the world to exist in unity and harmony and peace and love, and we absolutely shattered it. We've lived in open rebellion against the God that made us for peace. And in our grief, we might want to stop and pause and turn back to Him. Uh, And instead of turning angrily to one another, we might want to stop and talk to Him first and talk to God about what a, a world of peace would look like. Uh, This coming Friday night, we'll have a night of uh, worship and prayer, 7 uh, p.m., uh, at the at the Valley Center campus. We'll probably start out in the courtyard. But um, uh, I'd encourage you, when we offer worship nights like that, don't just breeze by those because you think you have something better to do. Uh, a worship night like that, it, it's not a worship service like this. There's no sermon or anything. We gather, we sing, and we pray. It's a time to draw into a place of intimacy with Jesus. And that's a way of of trying to reset our hearts back to the factory setting, back to the Garden of Eden where we were made to be at uh, oneness with the Father, where we were made to be in peace with the Father. And we draw into the presence of Jesus, and we let him speak over us and into us, and, and we are reminded of what we were made for. And we, we need those moments of restoration more often than just on Sundays. Uh, and if you're not in a regular habit of worshiping on Sundays, if today's an exception to the rule, we, we need a habit of daily worship, where we are constantly turning back to Jesus uh, and saying, I want to be restored to you and I want you through me to restore our world uh, because the world is very broken. And it's a, it's a painful, vulnerable reality to face. But when we face it with Jesus, uh, we can do so with hope and with grace. Uh, let's take a minute. Let's pray together. Jesus, send your spirit into our lives in the midst of our brokenness and heal us. Heal deep and old wounds that are festering. Make us vessels of your love where we seek not to get even, but to be graceful. God, calm troubled minds and fearful hearts. In this moment of worship, we want to draw close to you because that's where we belong and that's how we were made. And that's what we need. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We're going to continue in our series of studies on the letter to the Galatians, New Testament letter written by the Apostle Paul, first century preacher and church planter, written to a group of Christians in the area of Galatia, modern day Turkey. And remember, this is Paul's most angry letter. He starts out on an angry note. How could, you, how could you Galatians have turned away from the message I preached to you at first, which was a message of freedom? Jesus died for you and set you free. And now you're running back to the law and trying to earn your way to heaven by doing good things. You're never going to be able to do that. Why would you go back? And so Paul is mad at the Galatians, 
and then he gets mad at Peter, and he talks about how he called out Peter and Barnabas in front of everybody else, and then he's mad at James, and he gets in a fight with James, and we looked at that last week. Uh, and today, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul softens, and we get to see some of the gentle heart behind all of Paul's passion and vigor. Paul is out to save the Galatians from going astray. But we see now in Galatians chapter 4, he does that from a spirit of love, from a place of love. And so we're going to read in Galatians chapter 4 and look at uh, the, the motivation that has uh, brought about all of Paul's passion thus far. Galatians chapter 4 at verse 12, uh, listen to God's word. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. Um, the better translation here would be, you were nothing but gracious to me. That's how we'd say it today. I came and visited you, and you were nothing but, but sweet to me. You're nothing but gracious to me. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Now, this is kind of an interesting autobiographical note, and we'll, we'll come back to this uh, because I have a theory about what this illness is. Uh, it was because of an illness that I preached the gospel to you, and even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Uh, and this actually often happens when Paul or the other disciples go to a new town because they can work miracles. They heal the sick. They go and they pray for people and people are restored. And so often they're greeted as though uh, they're one of the Greek gods. They get called Zeus and Hermes. Uh, and so often Peter or Paul will have to say, hold on, hold on a second, guys. We're just normal folks. We're just normal folks, but we know Jesus and that's how we do what we do here. And uh, he says, you welcome me as if I were an angel of God or Christ Jesus himself. It wasn't because he was a nice guy. In fact, he was kind of a grouchy guy. And it's not because he was a great speaker. In fact, we have reason to believe he was not a particularly good speaker. But he would go and work miracles. And so they would treat him like an angel. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people, and here he's talking about the, the guys from Jerusalem, from James, who have come down to preach the law again, to tell the Galatians, you're not free, go back and follow the law. Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, uh, now, Paul's going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. This verse is just Paul wandering on a tangent, and this is how he writes. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, and not just when I'm with you. Uh, Paul does what one biblical scholar called, he, he goes off on a word. And so Paul's actually talking about how people have come from Jerusalem to lead the Galatians astray, and he says the word zealous a couple times, and then he decides he's going to pontificate on the word zealous. And it's not really on topic anymore. He's wandered off topic because he's talking about the, they just want to be zealous for you, so you'll be zealous for them. Speaking of zealous, it's good to be zealous, but not all the time. Sometimes, always, but not when, just when I'm with you, but, but to be zealous for the right. He, like, he goes off on this tangent. And in terms of literary style, it, it is just annoying. But that is how Brother Paul writes. Okay, so now verse 19, he comes back. My dear, dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Okay, before we get into the, the meat of what Paul wants to say here, let me tell you about that illness. Because Paul says it was because of an illness that I, preach, I first preached the gospel to you. Um, I, I have a, a, a running theory on what this is. Uh, I think Paul had a problem with his vision. Uh, the, the word illness in our minds in modern English makes you think of germs, makes you think of a sickness. But the uh, Greek word here is asthenia, which, which means any kind of weakness. And in fact, asthenopia is a weakness of the eyes. And so I think Paul is actually referencing uh, a, a problem with his eyes because he says later in this text, I, I came to you because of an illness and it was a burden on you. They had to take care of him. And you, you know that you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me if you could. I don't think that's just a random line or a kind of graphic gross line. I think he's referring to the fact that he had a vision problem. Back in the ancient world, they had not perfected eyeglasses the way we have today. In fact, there's one uh, ancient story about Nero, the emperor of Rome in 65 AD, watching the gladiators kill each other through an emerald. He used the, the bent curvature of an emerald to magnify the fight so he could see them, sort of a, 
kind of a, a gory graphic uh, image of the, the lust and power of the Roman Empire. Look, we're looking through a precious gem to watch people kill each other. And, and there was a, a powder that was developed uh, called pharygium pow powder that was uh, popular in the first century world. They were working on eye problems, but they didn't have eyeglasses. So if Paul had particularly bad vision, he, he probably stumbled around. And I think, I think that's confirmed elsewhere uh, in the Bible because in Galatians chapter 6, at the end of this, this letter, he'll say, see what large letters I write to you with my own hand. And I think maybe the reason he wrote with such large letters is he couldn't see them otherwise. Uh, and then we see elsewhere in the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul says, I have a thorn in the flesh, a physical problem, that I've prayed for multiple times and it hasn't been fixed. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, as you get older, uh, pray over your eyesight and, and keep wearing your glasses. A very famous uh, charismatic healer of a century ago uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth uh, had all kinds of healing miracles to his name, uh, but still wore eyeglasses. And uh, so I, th I think that's what, what's going on with Paul. He even in Acts, Acts uh, 20, uh, 23, yeah, Acts 23, he, uh, he insults the high priest and he's struck for it. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was the high priest. But the high priest wore specific vestments that identified the high priest. So if Paul didn't realize it, it might've been a vision problem. So, so that's my theory on Paul's illness that might have brought him to Galatia and uh, made them take care of him. And that's not really uh, the main point of Paul's letter, nor of my sermon. But if Paul gets to go off on tangents, so do I. Okay, let's go back. Uh, I realize here in Paul's now compassionate appeal to the Galatians, he's been very fierce early on. He's been very angry early on. And now you see the sort of the gentle, gentle underbelly of this. Uh, he says, I came to you, uh, and, and I became like you. I joined you. You cared for me. You treated me like I was an angel, right? Let, where is that? Let's, let's remember that. He appeals backwards to a, a history of mutual compassion, right? That's, that's part of the, the groundwork that he's going to lay here. Remember the mutual compassion we had for each other. And then he makes a second appeal uh, for a, a future of mutual respect, I, I wish I could be with you now. I'm, I'm confused about you. I, I wish I could become, I wish I could come back to you because I'm still waiting like I'm in the pains of childbirth for Christ to be formed in you. There's still this hopeful future that Paul is looking towards. And I realize in the maintenance of healthy relationships in a broken world, we need these two things. We need a, a history of mutual compassion and a future of, future of mutual respect. And that's Paul's appeal here. They, they have this, this history together, he and the Galatians, of caring for one another. And he still has this hope that Christ will be formed in them. Uh, that actually reminds me of, um, of our Glendora campus. For those of you over on the Glendora campus uh, this morning watching today, there, there was a history of mutual compassion that brought us together. Uh, back in the early days of real life church, we rented the, the property of what was then Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, for our midweek programs, for our kids and our student programs in the middle of the week. And we had no intention of ever owning that property because it was too small for our congregation. Even if we had multiple services there, we couldn't have enough services to worship there on a Sunday. And that's still, that's true today. That It's not a big enough campus for all of us to be there every Sunday. It works great as a satellite campus, right, Glendora? Um, but but we, we went in there and we began to rent the property in the middle of the week. And we realized this was a struggling little congregation that uh, at the, after a while their pastor left, they didn't have a pastor, and we started helping them out. And we did memorial services for them, and we cared for their teachers, and we sent uh, staff in to preach at the church. I, I preached there one time, uh, and we did everything we could for this little gathering. of There was about 20 people left in that congregation, and we went in and just began caring for them. Had no intentions of getting anything out of that. It was just a, a group of Christians that uh, God put in our path to love for a season. So in the midst of the pandemic, when that little congregation decided we, we can't keep this going on our own, it was that history of mutual compassion that made them call us and say, we thought of you first. We're going to need to pass the keys on. We're going to need to pass the building on. We thought of you first. And, and that's critical in building healthy relationships in this world. We need a, a history of mutual compassion. Right, Glendora campus? That's why you're there. Uh, and we need, a, we need a future of mutual respect. Paul says, uh, I, I long to be with you again. I'm still waiting for Christ to be formed in you. Uh, I have this vision of us being united, right? Though we're in conflict now, Galatia, 
I have this, this hope, this vision of us being united again. And, and that's, how we, that's how we go about restoring relationships in a broken world. Sometimes forgiveness is just that act of saying, if you open the door that's closed between us, if from your side you open the door that's closed between us, I promise I won't reach through and punch you. Right? Sometimes forgiveness is just the grace to say, I can envision a world in which the door between us that is closed is open again. And I'll tell you what, if it opens from your side, I'll be at least graceful enough uh, to, to respect the fact that the door is open now. And sometimes that's the first step of forgiveness, just being willing to envision a future in which we're graceful to one another. And that's what Paul's doing now. He's been fierce with the Galatians. You foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? You've turned aside. It's a false gospel. Uh, Peter did it wrong. James did it wrong. Don't turn aside. And now we see the gentle, the gentle, uh, the underside of that, the, uh, the background of that. He's compassionate for the Galatians. And he envisions a day in which they're united again, in which they respect each other again. Uh, and I realize when, when Paul speaks this way, this now, this now jibes with the theology that he's teaching in Galatia. Because in Galatians, he is, he is fierce to contradict the legalists who are saying the way you satisfy God is following all the rules. And the rules are strict. And you have to be legalistic about it and enforce them on everybody else. And that created all kinds of guilt. And that created all kinds of judgment. And Paul is, is fierce to say, no, no, no. We've been saved by grace. Jesus died on the cross for us when we didn't deserve it. And we can't deserve it. And we don't need to deserve it. You just have to accept it. And that then shapes the way Paul sees his relationship with the Galatians. Uh, Jesus can look back on a history of compassion for us and say, I came to you when you were in open rebellion against me. I died for you at your hands. And it is through my death that you are saved. I have this, this deep, rich history of loving you before you recognized me. Don't forget that. A, a legalist would say, you owe me. You should feel guilty for all that. You better get things right because look at what all I did for you. And there's some religious people in this world who take the message of Jesus and contort it and twist it to make it a, a guilt-evoking message. I, I did all these good things for you. Look at that cross up on the wall. Jesus is still up there on the cross because of you. That's not the message of the gospel. Jesus died to take our guilt away, not to make us feel more guilty. The appeal of the gospel, the appeal of Jesus to us is, look at the compassion I have always had for you. I have, I have always loved you. If you've grown up in a religious context that made you feel guilty, that used guilt to manipulate you, I apologize that there are religious institutions that have so distorted the message of Jesus, a message that was to, to set us free from guilt, and they've used it to make more guilt. Paul is now appealing out of compassion to the Galatians because this is his theology. Hey, we loved each other. I came to you. You were nothing but gracious to me. I came and, I came and preached a message to you to say, we, we have this great history together. And then he looks to the future, and this is exactly what Jesus does with us. Jesus looks to the future and says, I envision a world of peace where there is no more tears or mourning or crying or pain. I go before you to prepare a place for you. Be faithful so that we can be together for eternity. Again, the legalist would say, you're going to burn in hell if you don't get things straight. Right? There's a terrible future plan for you if you don't get things right. Jesus' appeal is a future of mutual respect based on a vision of us being reunited with him again. And that should be the appeal of the church. The appeal of the church is for a vision of a healthy, happy life in a restored world where God heals our hearts. It's such a shame that churches have distorted that. I, I listen to Paul from a, from a theology of grace now stepping into, stepping in, revealing his heart, which is a heart of grace. We've been good to one another. It could be like that again, right? This is, this is his theology manifesting in his appeal to the Galatians. And I realize what Paul is doing here is, is good parenting. This is how good parenting works. Paul is being a good parent to the Galatians. And, and ministry is often a, a role of parenting. Uh, and Paul even uses a parenting metaphor here. He says, I'm in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. 
Uh, and uh, I'm, I may know more about this than Paul because Paul was uh, single. I was, I was present at the birth of both of my kids. And the pains of childbirth is a real thing. Uh, let me tell you. Uh, and the, the, the mom is in pain and the baby's in pain and people are crying. and It, it looks like people are angry. Uh, they're not necessarily angry, but the pains of childbirth are an excruciating moment that's leading towards the, the patient waiting for affection. It's an intense pain with a, a deep promise of hope. Uh, and I know some of you are going to think you don't have any right to talk about that because you're a guy. Uh, and though I was present at the birth of both of my children, the only pain I suffered was from the things my wife yelled at me. But, but honestly... There's a, there's a parenting element to pastoring that I know Paul feels where you are waiting with patient affection for the good things that are being formed. And, and all pastoring uh, involves pains of childbirth as you wait for Christ to be formed in a people. Uh, this is what good parenting does. Good parenting appeals to a history of compassion. I have gone through terrible pain to bring about good things in you. I remember uh, uh, a teenager who was in one of my previous churches back when I was a youth pastor, and she said, uh, uh, she was a, a pastor's kid as well. Her dad was a pastor. And she said, uh, I, will, I will never doubt that in a, in a bad time, in a rough time, that my dad will be good to me, uh, because the one time he caught me sneaking out of the house at night, I, I climbed out the window, I snuck out of the house at night, I went back with my friends, and when I got back home, Dad was sitting in the living room. He had, he had found out. Uh, and I walked in the door, and I was shocked. There was my dad waiting for me. And he said, I want you to know I love you. And I just don't want anything bad to happen to you. And that was it. And she said, I will never doubt that when the chips are down, my dad cares for me. Because they had this history of compassion to which to appeal. And good parenting works this way. You have, to, you have to invest a lot of compassion in your children so that they know when they've done wrong, they can still come back to you. Now, I know some of us will look back and say, I did it, I did it wrong and it's too late. They're adults now and I burned that relationship. The, the front windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror for a reason, right? The front windshield is what's most important. So in parenting, we have a, a history of compassion that we appeal, appeal to, but we also have a, a future of mutual, mutual respect that we look forward to, just like Paul with the Galatians. We keep our eyes on a vision of a world where we're reunited with our children. Uh, and this is important. Uh, I remember years ago, I had a mentor who was a much older guy than me. He was in his, uh, near his retirement years, and his children were all adults. And I remember him telling me, he said, Jim, one of my favorite parts of fatherhood is having adult relationships with my children. Because when you raise them, you're their caregiver, you're their disciplinarian, you're their teacher, and then one day they reach maturity, they reach adulthood, and your relationship shifts. And while you may always be dad, you're a little bit more of a peer with them because they are adults with you. And he said one of the things he liked best was being able to have mature adult conversations with his mature adult children because he had invested for years to bring them to the place of maturity where they could have a, a relationship of mutual respect with one another. Uh, and I'm like, I'm, this is on my heart now because I have a graduating senior uh, and she is still very young. But as parents... You invest with the hope that your affection will find its way to maturity. Before my kids were born, I used to pray, Jesus, don't give me a child that wouldn't belong to you. And you invest in your kids along the way in the deep hope, the deep prayer that your affection will manifest itself in a mature adult who loves Jesus as well. And that's good parenting. So for all of Paul's ferocity in the book of Galatians, in the letter of Galatians, for all of, for all of his anger, there's a deep compassion that underlies it. Galatians, you and I loved each other. Remember that? I, the day will come again. I, I, I trust that Christ is being formed in you. The day will come again where we see each other and can care for one another. 
And, and in saying that, in parenting the Galatians, Paul is mirroring God. Because God says to you and I right now, I loved you before you were born. I loved you before you knew my name. I walked the earth 2,000 years before you did to die specifically for you. Remember that compassion that I've had for you. And I have a vision for our future together. If you'll trust me, I'm not going to play with your guilt. And I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm going to call you to a place where you are a mature, independent adult who knows me and loves me and stands on your own two feet. Uh, in, his, uh, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, uh, C.S. Lewis writes uh, a, group, a bunch of letters that are uh, purportedly written from one demon to another demon teaching him how to tempt human beings and lead them astray from God, um, whom he calls the enemy. And he says, uh, at one point he says, uh, he says, God actually loves these little vermin. And the, the more they draw close to him, the more they become fully themselves. And that's what God wants for us. That we would grow in maturity until we stand on our own two feet and live in relationship with him as mature adults. That's, that's Paul's theology. And so that's Paul's pastoring. Uh, and good parenting should be good church life. Uh, this, this is how churches ought to be formed. Uh, churches ought to do the same two things that uh, Paul is doing here. They ought to be able to appeal backwards to a history of compassion, and they ought to be able to appeal forwards to a vision of mutual respect. Legalistic churches will always try to use guilt and manipulation to get what they want out of people. There's a, a kind of brittle utilitarianism that comes from a lot of churches out there today, even very successful churches. Utilitarianism is the belief that you do the most good for the most number of people. And there's some churches functioning like that. But the problem is utilitarians often disrespect the dignity of the individual. Uh, I heard a pastor uh, tell a story about going to be a guest preacher at a very big church. And before he went up on stage to give his talk, he went back to the nursery where some volunteers were taking care of kids so their parents could attend the talk. And these volunteers couldn't attend the talk because they were off in the nursery taking care of kids. And he walked back into the nursery and he said, hey, I just want you to know I appreciate what you're doing back here. I appreciate you volunteering and giving your time this way. And he said, one of the volunteers in the nursery turned to him and said, you're the only person who's ever said that. And that's a kind of utilitarianism that says, we're going to do the most good for the most number of people and we're going to ignore the few people in the back whom we can disregard. And Jesus never does that. Jesus never disregards the dignity of the individual for the sake of drawing a crowd. And churches that play on guilt and manipulation in order to get big crowds together are missing the heart of the gospel, which is a God who appeals back to compassion and, and looks to a future of mutual respect because he cares about every single one of us individually. Uh, good churches uh, have taken up um, the, the temptation that was offered to Jesus before he began his ministry. Uh, Satan appears to Jesus when he's off in the wilderness. And uh, at one point he says, if you'll worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you power over everybody if you'll only turn and worship me. And there are churches which have, have lost the gospel, which are happy to take control of, over people regardless of who they have to worship to do it. Uh, there's a, a famous novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky called The Brothers Karamazov. And in The Brothers Karamazov, uh, Dostoevsky crafts a parable. Uh, one of the most famous chapters in this book is called The Grand Inquisitor. And in The Grand Inquisitor, Dostoevsky imagines a scene back during the Spanish Inquisition in which Jesus comes back to the earth and is walking around the earth. And the Inquisition, which is torturing people to get them to believe in Jesus, torturing them to come to faith, takes hold of Jesus and arrests him. And there's a scene where a Grand Inquisitor a leader in the Inquisition goes and interviews Jesus in a jail cell. And he tells Jesus, the one mistake you made was rejecting the temptation of Satan that he gave to you. When he said, you should take power over the world, you should have said yes. Because if you did, you could have made the world good. And in the parable, Jesus stands up, says nothing, gives the Inquisitor a kiss on the cheek. And walks away. The danger for successful churches today. Is that they would drive a kind of utilitarianism. That seeks out big crowds. 
and tries to control them and manipulate them and guilt them into doing what's right and loses track of the gospel that says you are loved and dignified as an individual because Jesus chose you. You're not a number in the crowd. Jesus chose you. And he wants you to remember this history of compassion in which he has pursued you fiercely. And he wants you living in this vision of a future in which he he longs for you and him to be reunited again. That's the gospel, and that's Paul's message to the Galatians. So here in this text, we see Paul soften, soften quite a bit. We see Paul turn off of uh, his, uh, his fierce message that, that he began, uh, fighting with the legalist. And now we get to see the fact that Paul himself is not a legalist. He's not going to appeal to their guilt. He's not going to appeal to their debt. He's going to appeal to them in love. And in so doing, Paul models for us the gospel, the love of a God who longs to redeem us. Let's take a minute. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you for everything you did before we walked the earth to prepare a place for us, to to plan lives for us in which we might draw close to you and know you and be parented by you. I thank you for your deep affection which will not let us go. Teach us now to go out in the world in love and embrace those who don't know you. Teach us to go out in compassion and hope to forgive those who have wronged us with a longing for mutual respect. Teach us to live out the gospel in the way we pastor those around us, in the way we parent those behind us, and in the way we love. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us today. Now, will you help us welcome others to real life? Share our podcast or find us on Facebook or Instagram at Real Life LA. If you'd like to become a supporter, please visit reallife.la and tap give to help us welcome everyone to real life. God bless and have a wonderful day.